Okay, we're just about ready to start. It looks like most people are here. Give it another 30 seconds. Okay, good morning. I'm Lisa Roberts, and it is my honor to serve as president of the Westchester Jewish Council. I thank you all for joining us today for this important briefing. We're grateful for our ongoing partnership with the Westchester County District Attorney's Office and the Center for Intelligence, and we're grateful for their time today. The relationships the council has built over time with our elected officials, and with the DA's office have enabled us to share resources and communicate critical information as we work together to secure the safety of our Jewish community. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees at this briefing have been muted. I suggest using the speaker view at the, set, the speaker view setting at the top right corner of your screen so that you can see the person speaking in a large box. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature by clicking at the bottom of the screen and direct your questions to everyone. We will aggregate the questions we receive and our panel will answer as many as they can within our time frame. Today, we are privileged to be joined by a number of speakers along with District Attorney Anthony Scarpino and I'm delighted to turn the meeting over to him now. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, Westchester Jewish Council for giving us the opportunity to to speak to you about uh, matters that are on your mind. I've brought with me several members of my staff. Uh, we have uh, Willie Schaefer, who runs our investigations division. He's our investigations division chief. Susan Brownville Vega, who is the assistant district attorney that runs our bias and hate crimes unit. Andrew Ludlam, who is acting director of the Westchester Intelligence Center. Andy Gracia, He's a senior investigator in our high-tech unit. And Mike Delory, who is a bureau chief of our Cyber Crimes Bureau. Uh, and this gives you an opportunity to ask questions, uh, and we will be able to answer them in regards to investigative matters, uh, how we prosecute cases, intelligence gathering capabilities, as well as uh, forensic background. So this is a unique opportunity you're going to have, and that's why I wanted to, to bring members of my staff in so that uh, you could hear directly from them some of the uh, capabilities that we have and do not have. Um, it's important to understand though, we have to be very careful if we have a pending investigation, not to be speaking specifically about a pending investigation as much as talking uh, in general terms. So with that, I'd like to uh, give the opportunity for the members of my staff to briefly introduce themselves to you. And uh, then we have a, um, a little presentation for you to get your thoughts moving, a, a PowerPoint, and then opening it up for, for questions. So with that, I'd like to first introduce Willie Schaefer. Willie? You're on, you are, there you, you un, unmute yourself. How about that? Now we can hear you, Willie. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm the uh, Chief of the Investigations Division, and I'll give you a fast overview of uh, the bureaus in the division um, and some of the work we do. So there's a, there's a gang, firearms, and narcotics bureau, an organized crime and criminal enterprises bureau, an economic crimes bureau, public integrity bureau, a cyber crimes bureau, and that's the bureau that Michael Delory on this call is in charge of, and a pleadings bureau, which is a bureau that essentially handles the court cases for um, all of the work in the division. Um, and so each bureau sort of uh, 
self-explanatory, um, but I'd like to just give you an example of what kind of work we do. So we do proactive, long-term, complex investigations, uh, sometimes involving eavesdropping, uh, use of undercover police officers, confidential informants, um, and complex financial fraud investigations, such as identity theft rings. We might um, issue a large number of subpoenas. We have a forensic accountant uh, that to do uh, analysis of financial records, and we work on these cases long term with um, state, federal, local uh, law enforcement agency partners uh, to build um, our, our evidence. Um, so a typical example might be our pattern crimes unit. Um, so we, you know, we might receive information often through the intelligence center that uh, Andrew Ludlam also on this call is in charge of. Um, there's maybe there's a, a burglary in Mamaroneck, a burglary in Portchester, a burglary in Briarcliff Manor, and um, what what the uh, police might not realize in each of the lo those localities is that it's a burglary ring. So what we'll do is um, we may get some information from a homeowner's Zoom camera, uh, we may get a license plate, um, we may be able to. Um, do an analysis of the times that the burglaries took place and actually identify, and we've been successful in doing this, identify uh, the car that the burglary ring uses as it goes from burglary to burglary. And then we'll take the next step of um, doing some surveillance and potentially getting a, um, a GPS uh, locator through a search warrant application to a court put on the car. And we've been successful in those kinds of cases and actually catching burglars um, in, you know, in action. So that's the kind of work that the division does. Specifically, the Cyber Crimes Bureau focuses on um, identity theft cases and any real use of the computer or to uh, commit crimes. And it also has a specific expertise and through our high tech bureau investigators, and that's Andrew Gracia, who's also on this call, is in charge of that investigative uh, bureau. And so he, he has a specific expertise in collecting and analyzing digital evidence that you would get from phones, from computers, laptops, desktops, all kinds of digital devices, and then being able to figure out how to um, use that evidence in a courtroom. So that's the group that we have here that uh, focuses on, you know, specifically if we're talking about Zoom bombing, that's the group that we um, have in the office that will gather the evidence, analyze it, make legal decisions in consultation with me and the district attorney. Just a little bit overview of our of our uh, division and the cyber crimes bureau. Thank you, Willie. Um, next, we have uh, Susan Bravo Vega, who is the assistant district attorney involved with our bias uh, and hate crime unit. Susan, can you come on up? Yes. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, my name is Susan Brownville Vega. I'm an assistant district attorney with the Westchester County District Attorney's Office. My, um, my position is director of community affairs, and also I am the hate crimes unit head. With that being said, my major job is community education regarding safety and the law. So much of my job is spent in the field educating young people, seniors, community members about law and law enforcement. Um, I also have the title of head of the hate crimes unit. That title gives me the ability to evaluate the cases that come into our office and determine whether or not they can be tried as hate crimes. Uh, there's a, it's, it's very easy for individuals to call something a hate crime because most crimes have an element of hate associated to them, um, but for them to be prosecuted as hate crimes, that's another story altogether. I work very closely with my team members, my bosses and my um, colleagues to de determine whether or not uh, the assigned assistant will be able to prosecute a case as a hate crime. So that's an overview of my position. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me to speak. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, next, we have uh, Andrew Ludlam, who is the acting director of the Westchester Intelligence Center, uh, former intelligence officer with the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
Uh, Andrew, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, Judge. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Pam, if it's okay, I'm going to throw up a real couple of quick slides here from uh, from a PowerPoint. It better explains uh, what I have to um, speak about here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. Anyways. Anyway, uh, as, as uh, Judge Scarpino mentioned earlier, I've been uh, the acting director of the Intel Center for about two years now. And uh, one of the first things I did when I took over in this position was uh, I set up a, uh, a school resource field intelligence sharing uh, network. And quickly through that data, you know, the data that we uh, collected and gathered through the school resource officers or the SROs, uh, we quickly saw how much of it involved the, uh, you know, hate incidents, uh, hate language uh, coming out of the schools, uh, particularly directed at ethnic communities uh, and uh, and at religious groups, um, especially the Jewish community. And for Have we lost Andrew? And from there, as many of you know, especially Pam, are you there? Boss, can you hear me? It's Willie. Yeah, I can hear you, but I, I can't hear Andrew. Yeah. I, uh, I we think lost we lost Andrew's video and audio. We did, huh? <coughs> right. Do you want me to move on to someone and then hopefully he'll come back? That's a good idea. Okay. Um, Andy Gracia. Uh, Andy's uh, head of our high tech group. Um, Andy, can you uh, fill us in? Uh, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Grassi. I'm the senior criminal investigator for the high tech and tech unit. Um, the basics for, for the high tech and tech unit is we are to assist both state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies uh, in the uh, prosecution and investigation of digital evidence. Um, we can have a, uh, we can take on the entire investigation where we do the entire investigation ourselves or we could be assisting one of the local agencies such as Scarsdale, Pelham, State Police, or in some of the federal agencies. Uh, our expertise primarily is in the collection and analysis of digital evidence. Um, so again, if a threat comes in, how did that threat come in? And how are we gonna obtain that digital evidence uh, to be later used uh, at trials? Um, we're not limited in, in any way, shape, or form. We do, you know, in the high tech unit, from the Title III intercepts to the GPS installs to um, the smallest of digital evidence of memory cards, looking for what we call trace digital evidence. Um, so when a threat comes in, um, we'll usually get a phone call from one of the local municipalities or from one of the federal agencies, and then we'll come in to assist them and help them understand um, how they penetrated possibly someone's system to then uh, being able to collect that data uh, and then assist the ADAs in uh, prosecuting anyone who may have committed uh, one of these crimes. Okay, hey, Andrew, thank you very much. Um, is is uh, Andrew Ludlam back on? Andrew. Yes. Not yet? Oh, I am. Oh, we are? Andrew, I don't have a video on you. Does everybody have a video on Andrew? Ludlum. Is your video on, Andrew? According to my computer, it says it's on, yeah. Okay. Although I, I am getting a message that my internet connection is unstable, so. Um, unstable, huh? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, county Wi-Fi for you. Okay. Well, we don't have any visual of you, so I don't think you're, we're going to be able to necessarily. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right, Andrew, try to give it a shot. Let's see how long you last. 
All right, yeah, let's go. I'll go through this quickly then. So um, as I started to say, uh, you know, we gather information, collect information from a lot of different sources, uh, from the community itself, from law enforcement, from open source media, from social media. And uh, what we do is we analyze that data and then we try to develop a clearer picture of who's behind these hate incidents to see if they're aligned or associated with any other groups that we're aware of. And then, and this is the most important step, uh, this is where our great pre-existing trusted partnerships with uh, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies comes into play. We get that information into the hands of the experts that can actually investigate and do something with it, uh, whether that be the FBI, uh, Department of Homeland Security, the state police, uh, the West, the uh, New York State Crime Analysis Center Network, uh, here as uh, you just heard from uh, Andrew Gracia and Mike Delori, I guess, uh, about the cyber crimes capability of the organic to the DA's office here, the investigative capabilities, um, as well as our local police departments. And that is key. And that's probably the, one, of the, one of the most important points I want to drive home here is the step off point for any of these incidents has to be with your local police department, whether it's Zoom bombing uh, or some other a physical act of, uh, of, of um, you know, mischief or something like that. Uh, because uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are a law enforcement resource uh, we are somewhat limited in our capability to share information with the general public. Uh, we do comply with state and federal regulations that do govern the, uh, uh, the exercise of First Amendment speech and First Amendment uh, rights. Um, but uh, engage your local police departments to the, at first and, and foremost, uh, get them on board early, and then we can share information more freely with them. And what they in turn decide to do with it uh, is, is to get, in the hands, get into your hands the way they best see fit. Um, I'd also like to quickly mention that uh, uh, despite you know, our, our somewhat limited ability to share with, uh, with private groups, uh, the information that we develop, we have improved that quite a bit. And uh, on the call today is, uh, is Bill Hayes, uh, my predecessor here at the Intel Center, um, now security manager with the Community Security Initiative. Uh, and that, if, if anything, has streamlined our ability to, to develop and share information uh, with your community here. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Judge. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mike Delory, can you come on on? Yes, Judge, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you right now. Great, thank you. Uh, so over the past few weeks throughout the country, there's been a proliferation of Zoom bombing cases. And unfortunately, it's also happened here in our county. And we have been involved in uh, doing these investigations, and we also have a general approach to these types of online and computer crime uh, cases. We, uh, we look to see who is the person behind the keyboard. That is the ultimate goal, We're trying to find who was committing the crime. Um, we start with a universe of people, anybody that was online, that was uh, communicating at that particular date, and time, and then we're trying to really look for where is that place uh, that they were coming from and using the computer. We try to narrow this down by using various methods, including grand jury subpoenas and search warrants. Uh, we are going to use the uh, information that we've uh, been given, just typically uh, emails, and also uh, it can be uh, internet protocol addresses, which are really great in trying to trace back uh, the location that the uh, communication or the other uh, event uh, took place from. <clears throat> Once we have the uh, information from the grand jury subpoenas, we will then try to use that in order to get a search warrant. <clears throat> the search warrant is meant to, so that we can try to get into the location that we have identified. And then the most critical part of the general investigation <clears throat> is the last part where uh, we actually execute, which is something that uh, SCI Gracia does on a regular basis. And once we're in there, we now have to determine who it was that did this crime, uh, which requires Andy and his group to interview these people and see who was behind the computer. So Zoom is a communications company, and we have dealt with them in the past, a long time ago. Actually, we had a case of an email fraud where they were involved, and we, uh, we worked with them very well. Right now, uh, there is a security issue. They're aware of it. They are trying to improve it on a daily basis. They're coming out with updates. And just a few days ago, they had stated that they are going to be coming out with Zoom release number five. So you should be looking for version five if you're going to be using Zoom in the near future. 
It is uh, supposed to have a lot of improvements in uh, the security side of uh, the programming, and we can only hope that that's, uh, that's the case. Now, on April 3rd of this year, the uh, Pelham Jewish Center was using Zoom to maintain uh, social distancing, and yet also still have their service. And it was an open forum, so uh, essentially anybody that saw that it was there, they could connect and uh, join into it. Unfortunately, uh, that service was interrupted and for a few minutes, and there were some uh, fairly disturbing uh, images that were shown. Uh, we are not going to show you the video, uh, but I will show you uh, three samples of what took place. I, I will warn you ahead of time that I'm sure that you would find this uh, very upsetting. I will now go and show you the three images. Now, on April 9th, there was a, another similar intrusion. This time, it was with the uh, Scarsdale synagogues. And <clears throat> we don't have any video from that. However, uh, it was quite important to our investigation uh, when collecting the data about those people that were in uh, the room at that time, uh, we were able to get uh, two email addresses, uh, which will be helpful in us trying to identify uh, who the targets are. public. Uh, there was a short, brief interruption, which was fortunate because the moderators saw what was happening and fairly, very, very quickly shut it down so that it uh, was not seen uh, much more. Uh, again, this is another image that is disturbing, and I'm just warning you ahead of time. So the issue is what are the possible charges that the district attorney's office could bring against whoever has been doing this? And we're considering several different ones. Uh, the first one is the, the most obvious and why I'm involved is, is there a potential computer crime here? And that would have to be determined by whether somebody has actually uh, interrupted and gotten in, uh, to the system in a way that was not approved or authorized by whoever was conducting the meeting. The uh, other charge that we could possibly bring forward uh, is that in two of these, clearly, uh, there was a disruption of a religious service. And so that's a, a possibility that we have. Then there are two related uh, crimes that we could uh, take a look at and are considering. One is a harassment charge and the other is an aggravated harassment charge. Uh, both of these crimes could be considered hate crimes, and uh, as stated earlier by Susan, she would be the one that would review to see if that was the uh, appropriate thing to do. Now, there are a couple of uh, real issues uh, with handling one of these types of cases, especially right now, the uh, ability to get information from uh, Zoom uh, through the grand jury subpoena process and also the email providers and the internet service providers. If they do not respond or they take a long time to respond, it will make it uh, a bit more difficult for us to go forward. But uh, we're, we are hoping that uh, that will not be the case and that we'll be able to go forward uh, in, a, in a very quick manner. So the final thing is that we have a list of a few different places that you could go. Uh, two are very technical. Uh, PC Magazine is a great source. Uh, they've been around for over 30 years in, in the computer industry. Uh, the Zoom blog one is, is really nice because it is coming from the company itself. And the, the last one is one that has been used uh, throughout our office for explaining uh, how to go about these things. Thank you, Your Honor, and I'll now uh, shut this down. Very good. Thank you, Mike, for your presentation. So, um, you know, it's our opportunity to, to open this up uh, for questions. Um, I do want you to know when Mike mentioned the uh, difficulty in sometimes getting responses, 
uh, from uh, agencies in which we're serving subpoenas. Uh, it's just envision what's going on when you're trying to reach out to your bank or any, any place. Um, there are uh, personnel um, are out um, or they're working uh, from home. Uh, in some cases, we have found actually the turnaround time is actually faster. Uh, other times, uh, you know, it can be delayed uh, based upon the fact that, uh, you know, pe uh, businesses are not operating uh, in a normal fashion right now. So with that, um, I guess, you know, uh, Pam and, and the people that are running this uh, can start filling in, uh, sending us questions, and I'll see if we can, I can help direct where they should go or try to answer them myself. If you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat box. So you have a couple of questions about the technology. I'll just say um, that Zoom, the company Zoom, which is not the only way to do a, um, a conference, has done significant upgrading of their security options, which anybody can use uh, on their screens. Um, indeed, this call or this Zoom call would have looked differently if it was done two months ago. Um, but for the um, Mr. Scarpino and for, for your team, Looking at, looking at one um, of the questions, um, have you seen, have any other uh, religious groups experienced any kind of Zoom bombing? Are you seeing this in other ethnic groups? Is this uh, only right now in the Jewish community in Westchester? Um, the best of my knowledge um, right now, of course, I've been, you know, Andrew Ludlam is involved um, and uh, my whole team has been involved. We know that the other religious organizations, the ones I'm aware of have been Jewish organizations. There was a Zoom bombing of a, um, a library uh, meeting. Um, I'm not sure if uh, over the weekend, uh, whether Andrew or um, Willie became aware of any other religious organizations at this point in time here in Westchester. Uh, Willie, do you have any additional information? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't believe we've had any. Well, I'm not aware of any complaints other than the uh, the anti-Semitic ones. Okay. How about you, Andrew? Did you hear anything new? No, Judge. I haven't seen anything come across my radar. Uh, I have been getting situational incident reports uh, from the state police and the FBI recently. Uh, they are showing a host of different uh, intrusions, as you mentioned, libraries, other uh, government and civic groups using it, but none directed. Uh, at anti-Semitic or no, no, no uh, Jewish groups were targeted here in Westchester other than the two incidents that we've been discussing here this morning. Very good. Thank you. Next question. A recurring question is, has there been, to the extent that you're allowed to comment, have there been any, any leads? Are these related? Um, and somebody asked a question, I'll just say the best way to preserve the evidence, you should always record your Zoom calls. There's no cost for it. You don't have to buy tape or film. Um, that's a great way to maintain evidence if and when needed. Also, Zoom has a standard feature that you can remove anybody at any time. So that should you should you should familiarize yourself with that feature. That way, in case somebody does something, you just remove them and block them, and you're done. So anyway, back to the question, uh, a judge. Has there been any progress which you're allowed to talk about? And if so, are they related, et cetera? Um, well, so as you know, we can't, we can't give too much information in regards to it. We're working on it. Has there been progress? I will say, yes, there's always, there is some progress. That's about all I really can, you know, would want to say about a particular case. Sure. As we wait for a couple of more calls, um, 
you should know that the ADL has done extensive work in this area in partnership with the DA's office, with the council, they're very active nationwide and indeed in Westchester. They could not be on the call today, but they've offered webinars. And if anybody needs training about this, we're gonna be sending out later on um, about a webinar next week on white supremacy um, and such. So, oh, Steve Ginsburg is on. Hello, Steve uh, from the ADL. So um, can't say enough good things about ADL as well as many other organizations. I don't know, um, a Judge, if you want to talk about about the ADL, et cetera. Well, well I think I think that uh, Andrew Ludlam, uh, you know, our intelligence center is involved with their security committee, um, and we are, uh, you know, sharing information, and we work closely with them as well as uh, any any other organization in law enforcement to assist us, uh, you know, in regards to identifying um, individuals that have uh, different have agendas that are concerned to us. Um, so, um, I, you know, I think that's, you know, a, a good, good connection that we have, and we're very happy that we work closely with them. Andrew, is there something you'd like to say in regards to that? Yes, Judge, absolutely. So, uh, you're correct. I am part of the, uh, you know, the, the Security Council that uh, ADL hosts uh, semi-annual meetings. I attend those. Not only that, but I had the pleasure of uh, attending the uh, advanced training school that the ADL offers a number of years ago in my last job. And um, one thing I learned there, and I've actually leveraged it here in this position, is uh, so as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about some of the limitations the Westchester Intel Center and all Intel centers have with sharing information with private entities and the public, is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of data mining restrictions. Um, the ADL does not have those restrictions, so there are many cases in, uh, that that have been used uh, in which the ADL services and their vast collection efforts and apparatuses have been used to help in criminal matters. So, um, you know, I encourage people to keep them engaged. Uh, we've sent, you know, we've run into some, uh, into some brick walls with some of our, uh, you know, some of our analysis that we've done here on subjects, and I've sent it over to the ADL. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are countless uh, success stories in which uh, the ADL may, ADL may have some records of an incident that wouldn't necessarily be captured and maintained and stored in a government database. So um, I've found our, you know, our partnership with them is, is, uh, is irreplaceable and uh, it's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous organization, uh, especially in these things. And if, I think if anybody's really going to be the tip of the spear on these anti-Semitic uh, Zoom bombing incidents, it's going to be the ADL. Very good. Thank you. Next question. Something which always comes up, Judge, um, how are the local police departments, which are of course independent, focusing on this, um, have, they, have they been made aware? Or are they taking it as seriously as your office is taking it? Oh yes, they, all the, the local police departments are taking it uh, very seriously and the information is provided. We have uh, the Intelligence Center has regular meetings um, with uh, local law enforcement um, in, in regards to all sorts of trends that are that are occurring and there's communications that are continually going on. In addition, uh, the the Westchester Chiefs Association, there's a, a lot of communication that goes on there and, and it just so happens the president of the Westchester Chiefs Association, the newly elected president, is uh, our chief of investigations now, um, our chief of, of investigators, uh, uh, Chief uh, McNerney, Chris McNerney, who was a former uh, chief of police over in Greenberg. And so uh, there's a communication that occurs there too. Um, it's, it's very important that we have a, a connection with them. They, they many times get the initial call. We work with law enforcement, of course, in regards to prosecuting the cases and, and handling and providing our additional high tech people. Uh, you know, we have uh, you know, great people that help them you know, do these things as well as getting support from the county police if they have some uh, some needs. So yes, it's very important. And it's a good relationship that we have. Of course, in Westchester, we have over 40 different local law enforcement agencies, not counting state and county police. Um, so um, it, that's the nature of the uniqueness of uh, the district attorney's office in Westchester versus let's say a district attorney's office in New York City, where they only have NYPD to deal with one police department. We have 40 different law enforcement agencies, 40 different chiefs, 40 different communities with uh, different issues on their mind. 
So I warned you um, that there's going to be at least one tough question. So this is a tough question. You're going to have to really, but now you're all war warmed up. I'm going to read it because I don't want to get the wording wrong, but it had to do with, um, with, uh, uh, with, with, with minors. Uh, let me just screen to it. Uh, where did it go? Uh, it was a good one. Uh, okay, here we go. Have you considered that the real culprits may be sitting behind accounts or equipment owned by minors to try to limit liability? Can minors be charged as adults in these cases? Okay, so that's, that's the extra credit question of the day. Well, this is, you know, I'm going to also let Willie weigh in on this and anyone else on, on part of my team, but uh, the use of minors, not just in this type of area, but in any type of area, gangs um, and, and other groups, is, is nothing new. Um, they, they know that minors are treated differently. There's a, uh, we, we treat them, uh, we try as much as possible to uh, handle them in the family court. Uh, we had to raise the age legislation. So the use of minors um, is a, a technique that uh, is used on a regular basis, I believe. Um, although there are just, you know, some minors, when it comes to Zoom bombing and, and whatever, there are some young people that uh, do this uh, on their own and not necessarily part of some uh, grand, grand scale or, gr or group uh, that we would normally be worried about. Uh, Willie, would you like to weigh in on it? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, my, my comment would be just in response to some of these questions I'm reading over the uh, chat is the, the good news is that we haven't seen um, really prolific continued Zoom bombing um, of this nature. So, and we are working on the cases that we know about. So the number one for us is always, if there is an incident um, and you have it recorded, that's the best option for us. We have to know about it. So in response to one question, you know, you, could, you should let your local police department know and you should let our office know. Um, and then we'll have the mechanism in place to gather the evidence and, and pursue uh, a, a serious investigation. So, but the, the, you know, the underlying concern here is, are there real hate groups um, that are out there that are doing what some have suggested in these questions, which is uh, hide behind teenagers who um, have different rules when you prosecute them in order to get their hate messages across. And so far in, in, the, in the development of our cases, we, we, have not, we have not seen that, but the key is always vigilance. And that's why we develop these relationships with the ADL and we have an intelligence center that has communications with the FBI on a regular basis and um, has the ability to look not just within Westchester at all the localities and municipalities, but also in the region and, and has a close relationship with other intelligence centers in the state and in, with Rockland and, and the NYPD. So th the key for us is really just staying on top of the information, acting on it when we hear about it. Um, and at this point, we really haven't seen, um, not that it's not out there, but we haven't seen really sophisticated network that's trying to disrupt um, the services. So that to the extent that that's the good news, that's that's important to know. Um, but on the other hand, it would never surprise probably any of us on this call if um, if that sort of ticked up a little bit. And, that, and that, that, the other reason I think this has been in the questions too is I think people just have gotten smarter about using Zoom. So even this call, we had a waiting list and we let only people we wanted to into the call. Um, people know how to um, mute somebody. Um, people know how to use passcodes now. Um, that that in people are getting accounts that are um, paid for and have more features. So those kinds of things, I think, have also just done a good job in limiting um, even just the small scale intrusions. So I think the good news is that um, we we haven't gotten worse. Um, and the bad news is that there's always the potential for that, and that's why we're on calls like this to try to get the message across on how we have to act on it when we get the information. Um, I also, I think, to just the way in briefly, and I'd let uh, Andrew also weigh in, and, and maybe even Susan brown Vega, when it comes to, you know, we all know that there are organizations out there that have a specific agenda, uh, and they are in different parts of the country. Uh, we are constantly monitoring them uh, for their activities and their presence here in Westchester uh, or in the Hudson Valley. 
On occasion, we will see posters and things of that nature that seem to be put up uh, from groups that we uh, have concerns about. But, um, you know, fortunately, um, I, I feel that, um, you know, we don't have any um, presence uh, of these organizations uh, that, are, that are out there here in Westchester that we are spotting yet. But we are, our guard is always up and we're always monitoring them and seeing what they're doing. Andrew, would you like to weigh in on that? Sure, Judge, yes, it's a great point you bring up. And, uh, you know, we are constantly mindful of that, uh, that overlapping circle of uh, hate crimes, domestic terrorism, cyber intrusions. Uh, there's a tremendous universe out there. And uh, thankfully, there's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's no shortage of reporting on it. And we are fortunate in Westchester to not have any organic hate groups other than the ones that were, uh, you know, that we've dealt with over the past uh, that have some ties to the white supremacist stuff and not naturally, naturally uh, necessarily anti-Semitic groups. Um, but uh, actually they, that uh, the one president of that one group left Westchester, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last year. Uh, we worked a lot on that case. I, there is still some, uh, I think there are still some uh, open aspects of that case, so I don't want to go into great detail about it. but. Uh, short of that, and their, their actions were not, they never directed anything in, at the Westchester community. There was just a, pres a presence of one member of that group um, who, like I said, has since left. Uh, but we are, uh, you know, I have a great relationship with, uh, with the terrorism investigators from the FBI here in the New York office, as well as the hate crimes uh, supervisor. And, uh, you know, uh, we are, we are sh they share with us uh, assessments, domain assessments, and so forth uh, for the presence of these groups in Westchester um, out of the uh, the Rye office. Uh, and uh, as I, as of yet, there's no reporting on anything actually uh, occurring or located here in Westchester. Thank you, Andrew. Susan, uh, Susan Brown Vega. Uh, Susan, dealing with the young people and and the types of incidents that we do see, was there something you'd like to to weigh in on? Um, the addition that I have is that it's really important that we get the information from the schools and other community organizations regarding those things that may not even rise to the level of criminal because sometimes that information is what allows us to build a criminal case if something, um, what would I say, I don't want to state it as more serious, but more serious occurs. So we have to know what's going on in the community. What I will say is the Westchester Jewish Council has been phenomenal in um, keeping us informed and we inform them also. Those partnerships are, are, are what makes the ability for us to do our jobs well. So the information we get from the Westchester Jewish Council, the information we get from the ADL, when we can go back and forth with these different organizations, the um, Millie Jasper's group, um, the Holocaust Remembrance, those groups are what we need and we need to be informed by our community. So I really hope that you continue to call our office, you continue to let us know what's going on so that we can better service the community. It's very important and we're here to do so. Yeah, I, I think uh, what, one aspect I always like to mention when it comes to all different types of criminal activity that, that occurs is that um, individuals that uh, sometimes they, they start up doing minor, minor offenses, very minor, and then they start gradually doing more and more uh, developing uh, their, their confidence in what they're doing and how they go about doing it. So being advised early on when, uh, of individuals when they're making uh, their mistakes so that we can get them on the radar screen for future looking uh, into uh, is of, of good value to us. Uh, so that's great. Thank you. Um, Andy, did you, I see your face there. Did you want to weigh in on this or you're just popping up? Andrew Gracia? Uh, no, I, you know, I agree with, with, with everything that's been said. You know, I guess my caveat is the investigation is the important side of this. And, um, you know, making sure the appropriate people are notified in the appropriate time frame is imperative. Um, when it comes to digital evidence investigations, the internet service providers only keep certain information for a very, very short period of time. So the longer that lag between notifying uh, us, uh, local PD, and us being able to get subpoenas and search warrants out, 
um, could really hurt those investigations. Um, I, I, you know, my, my two cents on, you know, the white supremacy groups and these other anti-Semitic groups that are out there is the internet is their, is their pulpit to voice their opinion. They, they get to a greater mass, even though they may not have the numbers, they feel that they're reaching out to more people and they can spread their hate uh, to a greater population. Um, it, it shouldn't deter us from, um, you know, dealing with those organizations. Um, but like I think Willie said and, and uh, Andy Ludlum said is we've had limited action, but we still need to always take care of those actions when those incidents occur. Thank you. Um, another question, Elliot? Um, okay, so uh, um, I'm going to give a question and while you're thinking of the response, um, I'd like Bill Hayes to give a better sense of some of the additional resources in the Jewish community. But the question which came up, and uh, we're going to give an award to Steve Adler for asking the best questions. Uh, to what extent is Westchester County using facial recognition cameras like they do in Times Square to protect our citizens? So while you work on that, Bill, do you want to give a quick update on the chain of communication in the Jewish community, in the Jewish community and your role? Yep, thanks, Elliot. Um, and like Willie pointed out, first and foremost, uh, when something like this happens, you want to notify your local police department. That's where this process will will commence. And uh, in, in most cases, the PD is going to notify the DA's office. An additional call to the DA's office won't hurt, but we want to get that local PD uh, in the loop as quick as possible. Beyond that, remember, a lot of times these things are not occurring uh, locally or, or they're not being generated from from local offenders and also they're not occurring in isolation they're occurring in different places at different times so at the Westchester Jewish Council we pay attention to uh, uh, these types of things in our region and it's important that we know and and keep the institutions informed as to what's going on around them and in my role as the regional security manager uh, my portfolio includes Westchester and the Bronx but I'm connected every day with my counterparts in the five boroughs Nassau Suffolk um, and it's important that I get that information so I can share it regionally and then also nationally. A lot of times these actors are doing things n without respect to borders uh, because of our connectivity nation nationwide. W I recently was made aware of a Zoom bombing case involving child pornography. It has nothing to do with the Jewish community. The targets aren't uh, Jewish institutions specifically and the content is an anti-Semitic. But uh, these incidents are occurring uh, in places as dispersed as Florida and New Jersey, and the FBI is involved in that. So it's important that if something like that happens here, that you bring the police in as quick as you can, the local DA's office. Uh, those of us here at the Westchester Jewish Council would appreciate the notification as well. And then one more on top of that, the FBI keeps track of these things uh, through the Internet Computer Crime Center. Um, and you can actually make, uh, as a citizen, a report directly to the IC3, which is uh, the acronym for that. So uh, the more people you loop in as quickly and as timely as you can, it's very important because it helps get uh, uh, a head start on gathering evidence, uh, facilitating information sharing, and keeping the community informed. Yeah, and I'd just like to weigh in the fact that, you know, Bill um, is, a, is part of the security apparatus for the Jewish Council and, and others is uh, of tremendous value to us. Uh, he understands uh, our intelligence gathering capabilities, having run that, that uh, location for several years. Um, we have a good working relationship with him. We have confidence in him. And so it's uh, just very fortuitous that uh, he's available as a resource for us now. So uh, that's great. In regards to facial recognition, um, Andrew, do you want to, uh, I'd like you to weigh in about what you know ab about how it's being used at all in the city and uh, by our federal law enforcement partners and our capabilities in that regard and how we handle it. Sure, Judge. Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, the, the, uh, the, at least the FBI does not use, directly use facial recognition cameras. They don't post cameras around. They don't even use uh, LPRs of their own, license plate readers of their own. Uh, they do get the data from other um, uh, from other organizations, from other agencies. However, uh, there are a lot of restrictions. And again, this is considered data mining. Uh, a lot of the, if you aggregate a lot of the data that can be gathered from uh, either license plate readers or, f or devoted facial recognition cameras, there are privacy expectations involved to that. Um, that being said, uh, I'm not quite sure how New York City is getting around those 
those concerns, and I do think that that's going to be dialed back someday. And what I can say is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Westchester County does not have facial recognition cameras dedicated for that purpose. We do have a tremendous facial recognition capability here, however, from imagery from other types of cameras, from uh, store security cameras, from home CCTV cameras, as Willie, uh, I'm sorry, as um, yeah, Willie mentioned earlier uh, with burglary patterns, from ring cameras and so forth. Anything that captures an image of a face uh, that can be used to develop a facial recognition profile. And we do that every day, and we do that well. Um, however, we do that upon request. We do not do it proactively. In other words, we don't have cameras to my, again, certain police departments in this county, as, as we all know, are very siloed, and we don't necessarily know everything they're doing. If they don't care to share it, they have no obligation to share what they're doing with us in those respects. However, uh, if there are, you know, we, we gather the, uh, you know, if we are requested to, and we're given a good image, we'll develop or try to develop a facial recognition identification off of that. I hope that I hope that clears up the question about uh, the cameras and so forth. So we do use facial recognition here in Westchester. We use it regularly, and we use it with great success, but we use it a little differently than they do in New York City. Thank you, Andrew. I think it did help out. Um, Elliot, next question. How are we doing, time-wise? Okay, I think we're about to wrap up, and uh, uh, it's okay to wrap up uh, before you might have a closing comment uh, from Jeff Kapilis, who's uh, the co-chair of our security work uh, with Dan Reingold, who is the chair. So Jeff makes the point, if we follow, which we should follow, the government's rules or, or suggestions about wearing masks, how does masks interplay with facial recognition? How do we, how do we balance those two? And it came from Jeff Kapilis. If you know Jeff, you'll understand why it came from Jeff Kapilis. So thank you, Jeff. Well, of course, I mean, you don't have to be a, a genius or a law enforcement person, right? Bill, I see Bill looking at it, to know that the people are, are wearing masks and everybody, it seems to be wearing masks, including myself uh, often. Um, it's going to, to have impact in regards to our capabilities uh, and facial recognition, as well as incidents when people walk into stores, right? If uh, Six months ago, someone walked into a store with a mask uh, on, uh, I think everybody that our, our concerns would heighten um, and we would have uh, you know, thoughts that this is a, a potential crime is about to occur. Now everybody's wearing a mask, so the mask doesn't, uh, doesn't mean anything. It doesn't lend itself to any form of uh, you know, probable cause or you know, some sort of reasonable suspicion level in, in the world of law enforcement. It means just about nothing right now. Um, but when it comes to facial recognition, you know, there are still parts of it, you know, the, that, that can be seen and eyes and foreheads and, and other, other aspects, but it, it, it clearly is going to have a major impact on that. Uh, does anybody else on the, on the team want to weigh in in regards to what I, my mentioning of this? Um, facial recognition is a mathematical algorithm that's, that's done. So what it's, it's looking at is spatial, spatial position between eyes, uh, nose, uh, forehead, and so forth. So if someone's wearing a mask, it would limit possibly the identification of someone, but most of the computer systems, the way they're set up, would give you a percentage of positive or negative. So it may say this is an 80% um, positive on this person. Then the furtherance of the investigation would continue to see if we can make a full recognition of the person. May it be a body mark, a mole, uh, skin, skin tone, eyes. Um, again, facial recognition in itself is a tool used by law enforcement, but uh, you know, as the DA would say and, and Willie would say, um, there's a lot of other facets that make these cases, um, you know, come come to fruition. Uh, you know, what's the IP address? Uh, what did the search warrant at the location say? Is there a picture from the original incident? Does it somewhat match? Uh, the people who live there. So you want to take all those factors and put them together to build that that strong case. Okay, I think we uh, gave it our best shot there. Elliot? Okay, no, so um, we want to thank, thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. District Attorney and, and, uh, and your staff who we work with, not just today, but every day, every day year round. Um, any closing comments? And we know we're gonna, we're gonna be an ongoing ongoing touch uh, as we always are. 
Well, uh, my my comments have uh, in, in regards to law enforcement are such that we um, we are here to help you. We're in constant contact uh, with you, um, Elliot. I, I I reach out to you anytime something pops up, and you you always reach out to me. Yep. I think it's important for us to to communicate. Um, and uh, you know these are you know every, every day you hear people saying some unprecedented times, and we we are hoping that we are going to. Um, start reintegrating uh, and you know law enforcement the courts are uh, have hit a pause button there are no grand juries meeting there are no jury trials there are no hearings there are just emergencies being handled um, it, it appears that there's uh, hope that uh, that pause is going it's right now it's going into May but that uh, that hopefully that maybe things will start to increase because it does impact our capabilities in regards to our investigations um, and we are uh, it's hard to go out and interview somebody, you know, in, in, with the COVID that's that, that we're facing, and and um, and we don't want to do it just by by way of some sort of Zoom conversation. There's nothing like sitting down with someone and actually asking questions and seeing how they're they're handling it, and doing it by way of camera is not the best, especially if they're a suspect as compared to just a witness. So you know, this is uh, you know we're hoping that things are going to start uh, picking up in the near future. Um, but you know we are not sure exactly of, of the timetable from a law enforcement view. Um, I, I, as an aside, um, you know I know Elliot, you know that I happen to uh, regularly, um, even though I'm a Roman Catholic, I, I read the weekly parshas and and I read them like three or four at a time, and and usually they don't mean that you know that it, it, all the moon and the stars all have to line up for the have to, to actually have an impact on something going on in my life. And just recently I was reading uh, one of the Parshas uh, that just was from last week, which talks about in essence, almost social distancing and your, your responsibility to, to separate yourself from the community during certain times of, of your life and how you reintegrate into it. So I would just leave everybody with the thought that um, if you wanna know how you should go about reintegrating and, and, and the importance of separating you know, Andrew Cuomo, there is actually a higher authority than Andrew Cuomo. Take a look at Leviticus, it's there uh, in the different Parshas, Parsha Tazra and uh, Mizorah. So there you go, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> On a word of Torah, we leave this session. Uh, again, thank you all, one and all, stay in touch and um, stay safe and wash hands. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon.